Hello class and welcome to the second installment of our discussion of Green's functions. In the second video, I thought it might be instructive to take a look at solving an initial value problem uh, with homogeneous initial conditions from using two different approaches. First, using uh, approaches that we're familiar with from earlier in the chapter, and then also taking a look at the same problem and how it can be solved with the help of Green's functions. So you'll notice over here uh, in our Word document that we've got a second order linear, uh, non-homogeneous differential equation with constant coefficients. Uh, and it's got homogeneous initial conditions. Both the function and its first derivative are zero valued uh, at x equal to zero. Uh, so this is uh, exactly the type of problem that is very well suited for solving efficiently using Green's functions. But it, it of course can also be solved using the techniques that we learned earlier in chapter number four. Uh, if we go and we search for a fundamental set for the homogeneous differential equation, uh, y double prime minus 4y prime plus 3y equal to zero, uh, that differential equation with constant coefficients has an auxiliary equation of m squared minus 4m plus 3 equal to zero. Uh, and that auxiliary equation has roots at m equal to one and m equal to three. Uh, so that means that we know that the homogeneous differential equation has a fundamental set of e to the one x, that's our y one, uh, and e to the three x, that's our y two. So the complementary function that's going to be part of the solution to this initial value problem is a linear combination of those two. Uh, it's going to be c1 times e to the x plus c2 uh, times e to the 3x. Now, having established that as preliminaries, let's take a look at two different approaches we can use to finishing the problem. First, let's review the approach that we would have used earlier in chapter number four, which is the principle of superposition. Uh, that principle would call for us to look for a particular solution that's based on the right-hand side of the equation. The right-hand side of the equation has 2e to the 2x. That suggests we look for a particular solution of the form a times e to the 2x. Uh, since uh, e to the 2x doesn't appear as uh, in our uh, complementary function. Well, when we substitute in a e to the 2x into the differential equation, y double prime minus 4y prime plus 3y equal 2e to the 2x. When we do that substitution and we replace uh, y prime and y double prime and y with the proper expressions, the algebra then is going to tell us that that constant a has to be minus two and that we end up with a particular solution of minus 2e to the 2x. So therefore, our general solution is gonna be the superposition of the complementary function and our particular solution. It's gonna be c1 times e to the x plus c2 times e to the 3x plus negative 2e to the 2x, which is our particular solution. We know that the general solution has to take that form. But what we don't know yet is what are the values of the constants C1 and C2? So in this approach, we now have to apply the initial conditions to figure out what the C1 and the C2 are going to be. There's a, a, a second step here. We apply the initial conditions that Y0 equals zero and Y prime of zero equals zero. When you make those substitutions into the, the formula for y, the first condition that y of zero equals zero is going to tell us that c1 plus c2 has to be equal to two. That's one of the two conditions that comes from uh, the fact that the function is zero valued at zero. When we take a look at the function's derivative and evaluate it at zero, we'd find that c1 plus 3c2 has to be equal to four. And that's our second uh, constraint that comes from the initial conditions. 
So now we've got those two constraints. It's a system of two equations with two unknowns. We can do some elimination. Find out that uh, C2 has to be equal to one. And so therefore that C1 also has to equal one. So both of those constants C1 and C2 end up being one. And our final solution is gonna be e to the x plus e to the three x minus two e to the two x. And there we have it. Perfectly good approach to solving that particular problem using the techniques from earlier in chapter four. But there's a really neat alternative way to solving this uh, using Green's functions. Suppose that instead of looking for a particular solution that's based off of the form on the right-hand side, Suppose that we go and we calculate out the Green's function for this particular problem. What would we be doing? Well, the first thing we'd wanna do is take a look at what the Ronskin is. The fundamental set is e to the x and e to the three x. When we substitute those in and we find the, the two by two determinant that is the Ronskin, we're gonna find out that the Ronskin uh, ends up being um, two times e to the four t that's expressed in terms of the dummy variable t. That's our first step towards finding our Green's function. In our previous video, we learned how we could find the Green's function. And we always find the Green's function by means of this formula right here. g of x of t equals y1 of t times y2 of x minus y1 of x times y2 of t divided by the Ronskin. And when we substitute in those expressions here, uh, we're gonna end up with uh, e to the t times e to the three x minus e to the x times e to the three t, all divided by two times e to the four t. And when we simplify that by using properties of exponentials, we find out that the Green's function here is a difference of exponentials. It ends up being half of e to the t minus, excuse me, one half of e to the three x minus three t minus one half uh, times uh, e to the x minus t, a difference of exponentials. Now, what do we do with that? We also learned in our previous video how once we find our Green's function, how we can use it to help find the particular solution to the initial value problem. And what we learned is that what's key to do is to take the Green's function, multiply it by what we call the forcing function that appeared on the right-hand side of the differential equation, and integrate that product with respect to t going between x sub zero and x. So you'll see that down here. That's a reminder of how we find our particular solution. So I'm going to take that Green's function that we just calculated. And here I'm going to multiply it by 2e to the 2t. Why am I multiplying by 2e to the 2t? Because remember, that's this, what we call this forcing function. That's the function that appears on the right-hand side of the non-homogeneous differential equation. Because of that, uh, we now know what we need to integrate. We're going to integrate that product. When I multiply out this exponential and do the, uh, the distribution there, we're gonna find out that we're effectively integrating uh, e to the three x minus t and uh, the negative of uh, e to the x plus t. And we're gonna be integrating that difference of exponentials. Remember, we're integrating with respect to t here. And that's not a very hard integral to do with respect to t. The antiderivative ends up being the negative of, 3x, of e to the 3x minus t minus e to the x plus t. So there we have our antiderivative, and we're going to evaluate that going between x sub 0 and x. Now, in this problem, x sub 0 was the number 0 because that's the point at which our initial conditions uh, were occurring at x equal to 0. So we substitute in t equal to x at the upper limit and we substitute in t equal to zero at the lower limit. And when we do our algebra, we're gonna find out that we have negative e to the two x minus e to the two x plus e to the three x plus e to the x. 
So negative two e to the two x plus e to the three x plus e to the x. Now, isn't that beautiful? The result that we ended up with there is the answer to our problem. Notice what we didn't have to do at the end of the problem there. We didn't have to solve for the constant C1 and C2. Uh, and we're not really combining a uh, complementary function with a particular function at all. Uh, we were using our knowledge of what the functions the, in the fundamental set were, using our knowledge of what the Y1 and the Y2 were to create the Green's function. And then once we took the antiderivative of the product of our Green's function and the forcing function, that result by itself was immediately the solution to this initial value problem with homogeneous initial conditions. That's what Green's functions are very good at. Green's functions are particularly designed so that when you take the antiderivative of the product of the Green's function and the forcing function, you immediately get the entire solution to the initial value problem. There's no need to apply initial conditions. You are done at that point. So, Kind of an interesting uh, difference of approaches for solving the problem, two different ways. They both start out by asking, well, what's the solution to the homogeneous equation? Get that fundamental set. But then what we do with that fundamental set is different in the two approaches. In the older approach, we say, well, we'll find a particular solution, we'll add it to our complementary function, and then we'll find our constants that make the initial conditions true. In the Green's function approach, because the Green's functions are specifically designed to deal with homogeneous initial conditions, there is no need to solve for the constants at the end of the problem. Once you've done the anti-differentiation of the product of the Green's function and the forcing function, the problem is done. So fascinating uh, way of uh, taking a look at two different approaches to solving the same problem. I hope this has been uh, instructive to you. Uh, and in our next video installment, we're going to go on to see how we can uh, leverage Green's functions as part, uh, you might say, the first step uh, of a solution to a, an initial value problem that does not have um, homogeneous initial conditions. Turns out we can also use Green's function to solve those problems. It ends up just being the, the very first step uh, in the process of doing that. So I wish you well, and we'll see you again in installment number three.